Hello Internet, I'm Kyle, and today's Python tutorial is all about functions. Functions are an essential concept for every programmer to understand and always keep in their toolbox. What a function is, is it basically allows you to define a portion of code at the top of your program, so then whenever you need to reference it later in the actual uh, flow of your code, you can reference it with just one line, and you can even expand on it with different options such as passing arguments in, returning values out, etc., or even recursion, which we're going to be learning about in next week's tutorial. But there are two instances, or really there are more than two, but there are two main instances where you might find yourself needing to use a function. The first and most obvious is, is if you have a piece of code that you find yourself using all in a, a whole bunch of different places in your code, but it's the same exact thing over and over again. So instead of copy and pasting that piece of code into different parts and wasting space and making your entire program very big and bulky, you can write it once in a function and then reference it with one line thereafter later on in your program. The next reason you might choose to use a function is uh, for streamlining your code. So even if maybe you don't need to write something more than once, if you have a piece of code that's doing a lot of different things at one time, you might want to define a function just to keep that uh, part much simpler because now you only have one line of code whereas uh, instead you might have I don't know, a lot of lines of code. Some functions can be really long, more than a few hundred lines of code even. So it'll really help to streamline things and it even helps making debugging easier because you can track down a bug in your program back to the function and when you edit the function it edits it in every single reference uh, made in that program so it's a way of centralizing all of your errors into one spot so they're easier to find and diagnose and easier to fix in the end and that just makes for a happy programmer so let's get into programming some functions let's take a look at how one would program a function in Python thankfully it is very very straightforward in order to declare a function, all you need to do is write the three letters def, which is short for definition. It tells Python that you're defining a function, and give the function some kind of name. So I'm going to call this uh, my function, my func, uh, and then put some parentheses after that. These parentheses are used to uh, help you pass different kinds of arguments into the function. But for the most basic types of function, uh, you don't need arguments, so that makes these optional and I'm going to have a very very uh, simple function that just prints uh, uh, this is a function some something just really simple uh, this is a toy example now you'll notice that uh, after we put the colon this indented four spaces inwards anything within uh, these indentations so these four spaces is part of the body of the function so this will execute whenever the function is called now let's say we have a for loop down here doing some probably not so interesting stuff so for i in range uh, let's just say eight so we want to do this five times and I'll say uh, my func right and uh, each time I call it I'm going to want those parentheses again because we're uh, calling calling the function and we're not giving it any arguments because like I said before it's just the simplest kind that doesn't require any arguments and so then when we run it it prints this is a function eight times because essentially what what this is doing how the the flow of the program works is Python sees the functions defined and looks at it and says okay here's a function it gives it a location in memory but it doesn't execute it at least not yet then we go into this for loop and each time this my func appears it knows to go back here and execute the function so each time this uh, range this iteration is going around it sees my func and it executes this printing this is a function once and it will do this eight times in total so this is really just the absolute simplest example of a function however a function can have other things like return statements so for example a return tells you uh, you can return some value from a function uh, which in other words means that this function as it's used in the body of your program will take on the uh, will its value will take on whatever was returned from the return statement so for example if we had some operation operation equals uh, 9 plus 3 so just some very simple math and we say return operation now next time every time we go through here and uh, we reach this my function when it executes becomes the result of operation which is 12 
So if we say print 12, uh, print my function, it should print uh, 12 now alongside every time it says this is a function because this function call has become uh, the object that was returned. This is kind of an abstract notion, but I promise it gets more intuitive as you practice it more often. The important thing to note about a return statement is that wherever the function is in its execution, when it reaches a return statement, whether it's returning something or not, like this operation part even is optional, um, what happens is uh, the function will stop and it will go back to the execution of the programming where it was originally called. So if you imagine the flow is we're in this for loop, it hits my function, it goes into the body of my function to do its uh, job, or whatever you've programmed the function to do, and then once it hits the return, it knows to go back here. And if it's just a return statement on its own, it returns none. Uh, so you could uh, check out what that looks like. It's just going to print none a bunch of times, which is of none type. I mentioned this before, but it basically means it returns nothing. Or you can return uh, some kind of object. In this case, we're returning an integer object, which is the result of our addition here. But what about those inputs that I was mentioning before? Let's put them to use now. So at the moment, we're adding two fixed values, 9 and 3. But we can abstract these into uh, variables a and b. And we can make those variables as our inputs. You define inputs in a function inside of these parentheses here. So I'm going to make um, inputs here. And these, these inputs here, whatever you name them, whether it's a, b, or it could be tortoise and hare, uh, have to correspond with what's going on in the program down here because if they're mismatched the program will yell at you because you you have stuff here inputs here that you're not using or you might have an extra one here that's not defined uh, so just make sure that they match and the other thing that you have to do down here now every time you call the function within the body of your code it's expecting uh, these values to uh, be passed into the function so you have to give it something so let's say we say uh, a is equal to 7, we'll do that by typing a 7 into the first slot, and B will make equal to I. So what this is doing now is each time this comes around, we get to this my function call, we pass 7 in as uh, in place of an A, and I, whatever the value of I is, which we get from this for loop, in as the value of B, it adds them together, and then it takes the result of the addition back into the main body of the program and prints it to the screen. So this is pretty much what this is going to look like here. As you can see, it starts at 7 because i starts at 0, so 7 plus 0 equals 7. And then i increases all the way up to uh, 7, and we get 14 as our largest number. That's uh, pretty simply how to use the inputs on a function. Another thing that you can do is you can even give it optional arguments. Uh, and the way you do that is you go into where you've defined your inputs here. And let's say I want to make b optional, so I will say b equals some value. Let's say we say b equals 5 by default. And what this does is, let's say, I only give a value for A, right? So only the first slot is filled, and I didn't even give it anything for B. Since nothing is defined for B, it knows to go with whatever the default we've defined is. In this case, it's 5. So see, we get 12 again every single time. I can change this to 6. We'll get 13 every single time. Uh, and that's pretty cool. Just make sure that when you're defining optional inputs, that your mandatory inputs, in this case the A, ha always have to go before and the optional inputs are always at the end uh, because if you do it the other way around uh, like for example if I'm trying to make A optional when A is first it'll get confused because uh, then you can risk mixing up stuff here and as you can see it's, it threw a whole big error and it just looks disgusting don't upset your interpreter like that the interpreter works very hard to run your code so far this is all great but we've only really scratched the surface of what we're capable of doing with functions. So let's try a slightly more challenging example and see if we can uh, push at least a little bit further. So this right here, you may recognize if you've seen my iteration tutorial from a week or so ago, uh, this is my find kings algorithm where it basically takes a small chessboard, in this case it's 3x3, three three, on which one king stands and it goes through the entire chessboard and when it finds the king it prints his coordinates out. So how would we go about abstracting this into a function? Well, we have the chessboard up here, which we can actually leave outside of the function because that will be something that we can pass in as an input. And eventually, what we want the function to return is the king's coordinates, which are uh, this print statement right here. And this right here is pretty much the bread and butter of the function. So this will go inside of the function's body. 
So we'll go down here and we'll start making a new function. We'll call this one uh, find king, and we'll give it one input. That input being the board, okay? And uh, right now, oh, and put a colon after it. Right now, board is the symbolic name for whatever input board that you give it. It doesn't necessarily have to match uh, the name of the board right here. So this is a name of a specific board that I can pass in called chessboard. Um, however, making these match won't help, at least not yet. And then what we can do is we'll put this all into the body of the function. We'll do that by highlighting all of it and pressing tab. And now that it's on the same or, or one indentation level underneath the function, it's all included. Uh, so, and what's important is that, again, as we saw earlier, the A and B must match uh, the inputs as well as the expression. So our input here is board, which must, must match the name of every single time it's referenced. So this, we should all call it board here. And one last thing I want to change to adapt this is instead of printing i and j, we might want to instead return them because that's the goal of our function here. Return a tuple that contains i and j, just like that, okay? So now we have the function created, and we're going to go down here and we can call it. So I'm going to say print uh, find king, and it needs one input at least, so it needs a board, and this is where we pass in our specific board, which is the chess board that I've made up here. And then so when this runs, uh, it's going to first see the chessboard and store that in memory. It sees the function, creates a location in memory for that with all of the procedures associated with it, but it doesn't run it yet until it gets down here where it says print find king. So it says, okay, I need to find the king using this chessboard. So it passes this chessboard into uh, the function here, into this body, and this gets renamed board for everything within the function. And so it searches through the entire board, and then when it finally finds the king, it returns the tuple. So then it goes back to the main execution where the function was originally called, and this uh, call of the function turns into the tuple of i and j, and that's why we can print it in the end. So that's enough yammering. Let's hit the F5 key and see what happens. And you can see that it returns the coordinates of the king. We can even try uh, moving this around, and you can see that this is properly abstracted. So it says it was 2, 1 originally. So this should say it's now in 1, 2 if we run it again, and that's exactly what happens. So this is a slightly more involved example of how you can uh, abstract a function using various inputs and returns and stuff. And this is great because now we can use this find king function in a whole bunch of other places, or even try recursion with it, which is the topic of next week's tutorial. Thank you for watching my tutorial this week. If you haven't already, be sure to check out my book. It's called Building Smart Lego Mindstorms EV3 Robots, and it's now available on Amazon. If you found this tutorial helpful, be sure to subscribe to my channel to get more tutorials like this every Thursday. And if you have an idea for a tutorial, leave it in the comments section below. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.